All right, I think we're ready to get started here. So welcome to the second night of forums. Here we have uh, candidates for school board will be starting and then later we're gonna get into some of the ward races. Uh, my name is Steve Leone, I'm the publisher of the Concord Monitor. I'm here with Jonathan Van Fleet, he's the editor. Uh, last night we went through the mayoral and at-large races. Uh, you'll be able to watch those videos on our website from Concord TV, uh, probably starting tomorrow. Uh, so before we begin, I'd like to thank the candidates, first of all, for being here. Thank you very much. And for the audience for being here. also like to thank Concord TV and Concord Hyatt. So candidates have also been given a chance to fill out a questionnaire. Uh, we're going to include that in our voting guide, which is coming out November 2nd. It's going to be in the Concord Insider, so you can pick it up where either in the monitor or wherever you pick up the Insider. We're also going to have a lot of that content on ConcordMonitor.com. All right, so now we're gonna go uh, to the uh, school board candidates. Uh, we've broken them up by zone, okay? So zone A includes wards one through four. Uh, zone B is wards five through seven. Zone C is wards eight through 10. Um, we have Jessica Campbell, Liz Boucher, Gib West, Cassie Cameron and Peter Sermanis. I am now going to let them introduce themselves. And uh, Jess, why don't you start us off? Absolutely, good evening everybody. First, I am beyond excited to be here. I love seeing lots of people engaged in local elections. This is what makes a great, strong community. My name is Jess Campbell. I am indeed running for school board zone A. I bought my home in Concord about three years ago with my 10-year-old, my husband. Since living here for these three years, our relationship with the local school district has been outstanding. We moved quite far away from my immediate family and left my support system about six hours away. Since living here, the amount of family I have gained from our district has been tremendous. We live in a district with such a safe and welcoming environment, and I want to continue that. My experience is I'm a regional bank manager for 26 branches across New Hampshire and Maine. I've led large and small teams across three states at this point and cross-border. I've led virtual teams. I've led in-person teams. I'm also an adjunct professor. I teach cultural anthropology, and I also teach at the MBA program for Southern New Hampshire University. I teach leading organizations um, and people. From a community involvement perspective, I am quite engaged with a multiple amount of organizations from the Concord Multicultural Festival to um, volunteering at the emergency winter shelter um, to just signing up for cleanup duty with Winterfest. I'm running because I believe quality education matters in a thriving community with good jobs starts with a strong and inclusive public school system. Thank you for having me tonight. Thank you, Liz, go ahead. Uh, hi, Concord, my name's Liz Boucher. For those who don't know me or recognize me, um, I live in Ward 5 with my husband and our two daughters, both of whom um, are students at Krista McAuliffe Elementary School. I'm an active participant in student and parent engagement. Some of you know me from Park and Rec soccer coach. I'm also the former PTO president, founding member of CMS Cares and in-district food pantry. As a member of the Capital Area Food Access Coalition, I'm excited to be working with the district to support social emotional learning centered on child food insecurity. One reason I am running for school board is my belief in that there, an effective board should be a group of diverse community members, including representation of service backgrounds for up-to-date voices. Currently, healthcare is not represented on the board. A balance in perspectives is essential for providing public oversight, especially when it comes to making evidence-based decisions. I'm a district parent, someone who is good at identifying and addressing human needs, and believe my current career as a mental health dietitian is critical in serving the Concord School Board at this time. Thank you, and a reminder to all the candidates, if you can't hear yourself on the speakers, the audience can't hear you, so please speak right into the microphone. Gib, go ahead. Thanks very much, and thanks to uh, the Concord Monitor, Concord TV, uh, and thanks everybody for coming. My name's Gib West. 
I am new to Concord. I've been here four years. Um, and I'm also, I live in Ward 5. And I'm honored to be here this evening. And, and this is my first time running for public office, despite the fact that I have spent 40 years as a public educator here in New Hampshire. Um, I guess, for me, the most important thing about a board, as Liz mentioned, is that we, we do need a cohesive group of people who are dedicated to uh, the students of our district and st all students. And for me, the vision of a quality school district is one that puts student learning first, one that focuses on quality curriculum and instruction and the relationships between teachers and students and maximizes that opportunity and the learning of all students. It is also a, a vision that includes climate and structures that support the learning of each classroom, along with diversity, equity, um, inclusion, and access. And also, safety is critical for us, as are infrastructures, facilities, et cetera. Um, as I look out at Concord in the four years I've been here, I am impressed by the active engagement not only of the community, but also of all of its um, teachers and students that I've gotten to know through um, Abbott Downing specifically because two of my granddaughters go there. So thanks for having me. Look forward to the discussion. Thank you. Go ahead. Good evening, Concord. My name is Cassie Cameron. I am um, running for school board member in Zone C. I've lived in Concord for almost eight years now, and I have two young children in both Millbrook and Broken Ground. Um, I believe that educational excellence for all of our students should be the touchstone of every decision that the school board makes, and I find that our, our, our city is very diverse, and what that means for each student is going to be very different. And I wanted to bring a new and different perspective to the school board. To be able to meet all of these different needs, we need people from very different backgrounds, and I'm hoping to be able to provide that. I understand that budget, no one's talked about that yet, is probably a big concern for most taxpayers. I'm also a taxpayer in the city. And I feel as though education for our students is one of the best investments that we can make because these students are going to be taking care of us when we're older. They'll be our doctors, our lawyers, plumbers, electricians. So what we put into them now is not only going to be beneficial for them, but the community as a whole later on. And so I really do believe that it is a good investment to make sure that we're making um, decisions that are going to help them to reach their full potential. And at the same time, being conscious of the budget and looking for new and unique ways to help raise the funds that we need for these changes without overburdening the, the uh, residents of Concord. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Peter. Hi, my name is Peter Surmans, commonly known as Peter Surmanis, to make life easier for everyone. I am running for Concord School Board Zone C, very simply because I'd like to give back to the community. Uh, my son was born here 19 years ago, been a resident in Concord for 21 years now. Starting from relatively moder uh, modern, modest Alton Woods, was enjoyable, moved out to Mulberry Village, and finally now I'm living at a home in Sewell's Falls. It's been quite a journey. And through that journey, it's been great to see how Concord has changed and how my son has grown up in the school system and learning to deal with how that works and learning to grow up and become a wonderful human being as far as I'm concerned. Now that he's done, I would like to give back to the community and basically concentrate on helping the children of Concord from the start to the end. I think that our school district can do better in serving the children. I don't have all the answers, so what we need to do is listen to everyone involved, from yourselves out there in the public to our children, to our people on the board, and also to our other elected officials. There is no simple solution, but we need to work together so that we can help the children of Concord. Thank you.
Thank you. And uh, we also wanted to let everyone know that on the ballot, there's going to be other candidates that are not here tonight. Uh, in Zone C, Candace Bouchard, the incumbent, said that she could not be here tonight. Uh, sorry, Brenda Hastings, my bad. Uh, my, my ward was in, my mind was in a different ward, I'm sorry. Um, Brenda Hastings, on the ballot, she couldn't make it here. And then there are two additional candidates in Zone A uh, that will appear on the ballot, Michael Guglielmo and Kristen Jackson. Thank you. All right, now we're going to get to our questions. And uh, many of these topics will be very familiar to all of you. So we're going to start with the middle school. There are two identified locations. One is um, near the Broken Ground Trail system, and uh, the other is at the existing Runlet site. The question is, do you have a preference of these two, between these two sites? And uh, in addition, do you think the school district should continue to explore a partnership with the YMCA for a future middle school? Liz, we'll start with you. Oh, what an honor. Um, well, as a parent, safety and the um, building structure, the health and emergency response time are first and foremost for me. Whatever location that can achieve, I think we're past due. There needs to be a middle school built now. I don't think we have time to explore other options, and thank goodness I'm not on the board to make that decision. I, I, I don't envy anyone who's sitting on the board right now who does have to make that decision. It's very complicated. There's a lot that has to be considered, um, and for me to pass judgment on anyone's decision um, is, is not fair. There's a lot that's not known yet. We don't have the cost. We don't have the um, traffic study yet. Um, we don't have the water and sewer information, and I don't think that's also fair for the taxpayers to hear what a decision would be without knowing what the actual cost would be of those items. Um, so again, there's a lot to consider. It's very complicated, but certainly I think that above all that the community feedback needs to be considered in some way. It needs to be weighted in that decision. Um, as hope to be representative of Ward B, I need to listen to my constituents of five, six, and seven. Um, and I think that they're, what the response in the forums is very clear, um, and that would certainly weigh on my decision. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Gib. Thanks very much. Um, Liz and I have talked a lot about this. In fact, we sat together at the last uh, working session um, with the board regarding the decision, which is certainly a difficult one given um, some of the goals that the board has in terms of increasing uh, equity uh, and diversity for the students of, of Concord. Uh, it's difficult to, as Liz noted, given the lack of information regarding cost and other elements of what's going on or we would need to go on near the broken ground site to make a clean determination. And I've expressed my concern to the board about, as Liz just noted also, um, the lack of inclusion of community input on this particular issue given the status uh, or the enormity of the decision. Um, in my previous district, this would be, have been voted on by the public. And in this district, the board has the additional challenge of um, anticipating what might be best based on their best thinking. Uh, the discussion among the board members has been robust and I think that the challenge is to make the decision um, and be ready to live with it. Um, safety is certainly a concern. Um, the, the, the concern I have specifically is by being close to the high school those students who might access or advance their learning as middle schoolers have much greater access here if we stay in Concord. So thank you uh, for the question. Thank you. So my, my view on this project is very specific. I think that we should move to the broken ground area. Um, I think that it's going to give us more opportunity to serve the, the community as a whole. 
We have 3,016 residential units going up to planning board right now. 1,571 uh, 1, are underway at some capacity as of right now. That's going to be bringing more students into the district. It's important to understand that if we build something, we should build something that should be able to sustain the needs of the community for a longer period of time. It will cost us more in the long run if we have to build two facilities. That was something that was brought up at other meetings where residents had said, what if we build two different facilities to meet uh, both sides of Concord? But one of the issues that was brought up is we would have to double staff and it's difficult to find custodians. And so where that might not, is already an issue before we've even started to build, we need to build something that's going to be future-proof. And while we can't see what's going to happen later down the road, we see that there's an expanding amount of um, building going on as far as residential units. Now one thing that I think is important is the school board is not in the business of real estate. Um, if we are not going to be using one of those plots of land or buildings, we need to sell it and that could go towards offsetting some of the costs to the taxpayer. We don't need to hold on to this additional building and land just to sit there. Um, and so that's what I would think to do. Whatever place we decide not to build, look into potentially selling it and that could bring in more homes to help make home prices and rent more affordable for the residents. Thank you. Peter. That's a great question as to where is the best location. I think we need to reach out to the community to get that. I do like both locations. There are advantages and disadvantages to both. Primarily, I think what we need to think of is what is most accessible for the students? Can they walk there? How can they get there? And let's face it, a lot of kids are gonna be bused in or driven in regardless. Where is that volume gonna go? Again, as many have mentioned, there really aren't too many answers to this yet. We have to look into that in better detail and get those numbers. But that's really what we need to start doing. And then we need to bring the public that information and get them more involved in actually helping to shape where this school is going to go, how it's going to look, and how it's going to serve the community. Thank you. Jess. Yeah, thank you so much. So in regards to the why, I am by no means an expert in this. My, my high level research so far is that the districts that do have that relationship kind of evolve together. So I think if we start that relationship now, I worry that it may extend the timeline. I'm also worried that um, as a community, we are just beholden to another organization when we are so passionate about localized control. Now for where the middle school should be built. $175 million is a lot for a community to digest. I own a house, it is a big scary number for my taxes for everybody, right? And I will say when I went to the community meetings, I went in thinking I want it in one location. I was like, yeah, why not? This makes sense. And after listening to our community speak, I actually walked out with a different perspective and it took me the car ride home like, hmm, there are a lot of voices that we didn't hear. What area wants the school? Who is going to welcome them so the kids feel super included and engaged? What do the teachers want, right? Are the schools safe? We spoke about this earlier. If my kid is going to this middle school, are they gonna feel safe? Are, am I gonna have to worry if the police can get there quickly and efficiently? I also think about our students and accessibility needs, right? So we're talking about diversity and inclusion. It's not just an economic issue, but it's also accessibility. If I have a student in a wheelchair, is it easier for my car to get there so I can get my student into school? So these are the things that I would like to prioritize. So I don't have an answer for that specifically, but listening to what our students and teachers need and what the community is um, passionate about, that's what would matter to me. Thank you. Okay, we'll probably, st we'll start this question with uh, Gib. Uh, so the district certainly has a lot of needs. Uh, staffing shortages, diversity initiatives, there's even letter there's even lead in the water, and that's just to name a few of the issues that are out there. But a lot of the discussion has been around the much needed but costly renovation of Memorial Field. 
where does that fall on your list of priorities for the district? So this is always a, um, a challenge to, to parse out uh, the role of co-curricular and extracurricular uh, activities or opportunities uh, in the life of students. Um, and, and what we do know uh, from research is that those students who are involved in our music programs, in our athletic programs, in any other co-curricular, um, they are more engaged in school and they perform um, better on uh, regular grades and also on testing. Um, I don't have a lot of detail about Memorial Field, although I know that it's been a, an ongoing board discussion about the investment there uh, in terms of specific numbers. I do believe, though, because of the heavy use of that facility by both our middle school and high school students, as well as the role that Memorial Field plays in the overall community, that um, the, that investment is a critical one to make. Um, so that's what that's what I'd share on that regard. Cassie. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I understand that extracurriculars are very important to our students, but I don't think having the best field, the most high-end equipment, will deter them from being in sports or other extracurriculars. It's difficult to say that we should prioritize a large amount of money to a field when there are other extracurriculars that don't have facilities that support them. So I think by putting this as a, a big budget item, we're saying that that's something that takes priority over other clubs, other extracurriculars. I think it would be better to look at making improvements that are going to impact safety, accessibility, but I don't think it needs to be as large of a upgrade to the field, that especially when we're talking about larger ticket items like the middle school. We really just can't keep spending like we can print money. Um, so we need to start budgeting. And I think that was one of the things that really got me into wanting to be a part of local government is I think when I have a budget at home, I can't just go make some more money or go ask you know, my boss for some more money because I ran out because I want to go somewhere. I have to find what can I cut to make this happen. And while I don't think we should completely cut it, I think updating it to make it so that it's safe and it can be utilized and working with the town as far as funding, I know that they're looking to put some funding to this, but I think that the budget and the overhaul should be uh, a, a lot smaller. Thank you. Hi, I, I do agree. I think the budget should be lowered for Memorial Field. I know I'm not gonna make any fans saying that. Um, I remember watching my son marching on the field. He was a drummer. Um, the facilities there are, I'm gonna say adequate, they're not the greatest, but then again, we don't exactly have that kind of money to go out and get the greatest. It would be wonderful if we could. Let's build two wonderful middle schools. Let's just spend all the money that we don't have. It would be great if we could do that, but we can't. So I would put this memorial rebuilding or improving kind of at the lower part of the list of things we need to do, because while it will benefit the kids, almost anyone here would say that yes, it will benefit, we have to prioritize and we have to determine what actually will help the children the most and will give us the biggest bang for the buck, for lack of better terms. That was a great segue for me, thank you. So when I think about this, um, what is the best return we're gonna get from our tax dollars, right? When I was speaking to actually a student that graduated from Concord High about the new middle school, she had made a comment, I actually don't care if it's a big fancy school, I just want a good education. And that was really powerful. And when I think about things like Memorial Field, yes, we need the space. We need a safe, healthy place for our kids to go and learn, whether it's inside a school or outside. At the end of the day, it's all gonna impact our tax dollars, no matter if it's with the school or with the um, council, right? It's, we're paying for it. So the, what's, what's important to me with this is the money that we do spend on the field, if we do this, 
are we building a space that is accessible? Are we building a space that is prioritizing student enrichment? And is it continuing the strong relationship this district already has with the community? We are building very strong citizens because of the great work that the district does with the city. Can we continue that and show our kids, hey, when we work together, look at what we can build without overburdening our taxpayers? Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I attended the public forum with the Concord School District and the City Council um, and the City of Council. I heard many design and amenity requests from the community members and how important um, that renovation is to many of those community members. There were more community members there than there are here right now. Um, I'm definitely interested in learning more. I don't have all the answers about what that collaboration will look like. I do think a renovation is necessary for that field. There's drainage problems, so half the field can't be used after heavy rains. There's not even up to um, code fields for female sports. Um, and it will be a big draw for community rentals um, outside the city for events. I do think, yes, money can be spent other places, but sports are something that's very important for social emotional learning and mental health. So that can't be discounted. Whatever that collaboration will be, I am interested in learning more. Thank you. Our next question will be coming from a reader. In recent years, I've heard a lot from the state and from the Concord School Board about college and career readiness. How important is civic readiness to you and do you think we should dedicate equal resources to ensuring our students are ready to particip participate effectively as citizens in their community? Cassie, we'll start with you. I think civic read readiness is something that's very important for our students to have. Um, it's easy to say that that's something that should be taught at home, but unfortunately, not all students have family members at home that can teach them those types of skills. So I feel, at least in my education, that some of the civic readiness was included in the curriculum. You would learn it in civics class, American government. You would learn it just in your community and interacting with the staff and the other children. Now, one thing that I think is fantastic about schools is it's almost like a rehearsal for life. They're going to come across things that they may not always be taught in class, but they'll get a response. They'll, something will happen, a teacher will talk to them about it or a student, and they'll learn from that and build on it. I don't necessarily think that it has to be a specific class for civic readiness. I think it's about building a good community where they can rely on each other and help to build one another up. Most of our curriculum does have a lot of the necessities in it, and I think when we have a very strong community, we can help reinforce that and really drive that home. One thing that could be looked at is maybe including some more programs in the community for extracurriculars, teaching different life skills. Um, but I think as far as during the day, we have a good mixture and it really just needs to more focus on building up the community so they have that support to reinforce. Thank you. I'm not quite sure if that's a fair question because what that means to each of us is quite different. And it's not really fair to just give an answer of here's what we need. I think the schools, considering my son just finished high school, are actually doing a fairly good job. And I'd like to know what is missing from there. One of the concerns that I would say is that Concord High does a very good job of not necessarily telling every student, you need to go to college. You can do things right out of high school that you can create a career with. And I find that very encouraging because that also means that these people will stay within the city, stay within the state, and become productive members of the community. So I'd like to know a little bit more about what actually the question is and what they were looking for rather than that nebulous term. Mm. That's my opinion. We do a pretty great job at it right now. 
when I put my name in the hat for school board, of course, like everybody, right, you start talking to everybody, seeing what the community is asking for, and I am almost ashamed to say how surprised I was by how much good there is. I am very passionate about workforce readiness. Um, I worked on um, what's called Project Search, which is a program for high school seniors with developmental disabilities, and we work with school districts and businesses to get them ready for um, the job that they want. Um, we do a lot of great things here in Concord, similar. We have a Project Search here in Concord, though we work with the hospital. I don't think a lot of people know that. We um, have a fantastic program, the two by two by two, where we help students here at the here at the tech center to learn how to be a teacher and they work through uh, with us and they grow with us. Um, so workforce readiness, civic readiness, I'm going to assume that this means learning about local politics, how it works, almost similar to um, like the Concord Leadership Program that we have, right, where we learn about our local government. That is critical. It is so hard to navigate local politics. You think it wouldn't be, but it is, right? So to simplify this, to make it consumable for our students so we can create outstanding future leaders, to me, there, you, you can't lose if you do something like that. But I would add financial literacy as well. So we know we're all passionate about inclusion, diversity, equity. We need financial literacy to help people understand the basics so they can start stepping out, so they can start learning and be more engaged um, with a different perspective. So great question. Thank you, Tillett Reader. Can I just clarify what the original question was? Yes. Um, How important is civic readiness to you, and do you think we should dedicate equal resources to ensuring our students are ready to participate effectively as citizens in their community? Yes, I do think that civic readiness is important and should be included in curriculum. I hope that, I, I don't know, I don't have, I only have a kindergarten or a third grader, so I don't have all of what curriculums, what's included in the curriculums currently. But I was part of the, f the focus group for the district that was held over the summer for Portrait of a Learner and defining what a Portrait of a Learner is. There was a di discussion between what is, a what is a Portrait of a Learner versus what is a Portrait of a Graduate. So we were tasked at what is a Portrait of a Learner, which definitely is different than a Portrait of a Graduate. I think it should not be discounted what a Portrait of a Graduate should look like, and that should include civic readiness and civic engagement. To what extent, I can't answer that right now. Um, but I do think the district does a fantastic job with the opportunities that it does have, such as um, the competency-based um, education that they do provide, internships, CRTC is fantastic. I was, I, I participated in a Leadership of Greater Conquer, which I graduated from last year. We toured the CRTC, and I didn't know, have any idea what our school district had for students and how amazing that program is. Um, it's just disappointing that all students are not able to participate in it. So I think that the district is doing a lot of work towards that. I think there could always be more improvement anywhere in terms of expanding what that portrait of a graduate would look like. Um, but yes, I do think it's important. So I, I, I think, I don't think anybody up here or anybody who's gonna be engaged in any support of the community isn't going to suggest that civic readiness um, is of critical importance as we particularly are finding a culture that's increasingly divided uh, based on politics, of which schooling unfortunately has become part of that, part of that paradigm, I guess is the best word to use. Um, I, I really believe, and building on, on what Liz said about the C, CRTC, um, if we're looking for students to be more engaged in the community, then we need to move beyond just introducing that through CRTC, um, but offering internships starting, actually requirements, to be engaged in internships starting either at the beginning of their junior year or the end of their sophomore year. So students are going out and trying on opportunities in internships in those fields of interest that they have. This would be part of the curriculum and can easily be part of the curriculum 
as you, as you build a curriculum that's supporting not only financial literacy, but the engagement in the broader community along with the civics education that we know they're already getting. So I would suggest that we look to broaden if we're looking for greater civic readiness and the board feels that that's critical or the superintendent and the board do, then that's something we could introduce as well that's more structured and not just simply um, something amorphous as civic readiness. Okay, Peter, we'll start with you on this one. How will you navigate the differing perspectives within the community regarding parental rights and oversight in schools, particularly concerning matters such as library books, course materials, and the teaching of topics related to race, sexual orientation, and gender identity? It's an interesting question because it's actually quite divisive within this town as well as basically anywhere in America. As far as like library books, I don't see the reason why any of them should be banned, regardless of which side you feel that you're part of. Library is a place where children should learn. Library is a place where they should be able to have access to what they want to see or what they want to learn about. Now, when it comes to the curriculum that involves that, I think that needs to be made, we need to make sure that's age appropriate. We need to make sure that we have the right people involved in determining where is the right point that we need to actually involve that kind of learning for the children. So I don't think we should limit what's available to children. I think we should allow them to be engaged in what they're learning and actually not be shielded from what maybe a parent doesn't think there is appropriate because the only way they'll learn is by being exposed to ideas that maybe they're not in favor of. Thank you. I would ask, why would we take away anything that represents our community? I go into this um, with my background in cultural anthropology and I teach people that we don't talk about the other. We talk about us. There is no them, they do this, they do that. I don't know why they think that. I teach my students, no, it's us, we're in this together. And when I think about our curriculum, and when I think about our schools and the board, we're a nonpartisan school board. That's what we're here for. We're here to represent every single student. And if we start taking away resources or books or start making something seem negative when it's just the way somebody is, what are we teaching our kids? We're not being nonpartisan. We're saying that's bad, that's them, they're bad. That's not what we do. We're here to represent us, our community, all of you. Um, so I, I think that when it comes to those polarizing topics, I think it's sad that they're polarized. I think healthy conversations with parents and students to talk about, hey, what makes you uncomfortable about that? Maybe explain it more and go to it from a respectful place. That's what we need is that healthy discourse. Thank you. Um, if we want our children to become autonomous and resilient adults, Concord School District can't allow divisive politics to get in the way of that in our state and our city conversations about education and in the state house. Um, this demands attention by all of us, all citizens, not just the school board and shouldn't be just the responsibility of the school board. What we can do as a school board is to anticipate and prepare for changes in the law, maintain a respectful and collaborative relationship with the school district and the New Hampshire Department of Education, and publicly confront issues that threaten education autonomy, child safety, and the whole health of our children. For those who know me well, I'm not afraid to have difficult conversations. I'm gonna date myself here. So as an English, teacher 40 some years ago um, when books came up that were challenging for certain students or families we had a protocol in place that we provided an alternative to that book um, or film the idea that we are going to limit access because we are worried about how students are going to interact with that text within the context of our classroom where they have the guidance and support of educators and peers. Um, 
it's a slippery slope and one that we've seen at some point in Texas, there were 335 books on a list that needed to be considered to be banned. Um, it's, it is about coming together as a group and as a community and creating protocols so the dialogue can take place. It can't be um, something that happens in a back room. There has to be a transparent conversation about the text or whatever the concern is, use of bathrooms, et cetera, um, because that is the only way we are going to support critical thinking, uh, support students making judgments for themselves and their children as they learn to go through the process of being part of a community because it takes all of us to be part of that community, not some of us. Education shouldn't be partisan. We shouldn't have them and us. I think that education is one of the biggest places that we can make a big impact on the divisiveness that we're facing today. I think that we shouldn't limit the type of books that we have in a school other than making sure that it's age appropriate. I think that we need to follow the laws that are set in place as a school board. That's what we're supposed to do, not help in making those laws, but making sure that we follow them. Our main goal is to make sure that we're supporting the children and providing them with an appropriate education. I think to do that, they need to know what's out there. They need to hear both sides. That's how they can make an educated decision and form an educated opinion. I think one of the biggest things that's going to help with this is making sure that we're educating the parents on any changes we make in the curriculum, getting feedback, making sure they understand what's being taught. Sometimes when there's something new that's unknown, it can seem scary until you know what they're talking about. When you go to the source, when you go to an educated source and hear about it, sometimes that takes away some of your fears. If you go online and search, it can seem kind of scary. If you have a pain in your stomach and it's because you eat something bad versus you go on WebMD and it says you have stomach cancer, um, it's better to go to a professional than to start doing it online. And I think it's better for these students to go to their teachers and people in the community that are trained to discuss these things and explaining to the parents what, it is, what they're actually looking to change about the curriculum and talk about it easing their uh, concerns and letting them know that they're a part of the process. They're not trying to manipulate, manipulate their children. They're trying to educate them and make them um, part of our society and understand everything that's out there. Thank you. This has been a great dialogue so far. We're going to have one more question and then we're going to move to closing statements. So this is another reader question. Do you believe it is the duty of the school district and building administration to be fully transparent with the school board and the public when things are not going well in our schools? If so, what would you do, what would you do to ensure that this transparency occurs? Jess? Yeah. That is a fantastic question. So, reader, if you are here or watching, awesome, awesome question. Um, yes, I, I think many of us will agree transparency is absolutely crucial no matter what. Um, if we don't do that, then we can't make educated decisions. We can't find out what our community wants. We can't find out what the taxpayers want. We won't hear from people, right? Um, this is actually one of my most important um, uh, topics as I run for school board is that level of transparency and the accessibility of the information. We do have a lot of great information out there. I think it's really difficult to find. Um, I have a whole bunch of degrees and it's so hard to find some of the information that we need to make some decisions for our kids. Um, one of my priorities will be making sure the, the website is a little bit more user friendly, that we have information on there that the community is asking for. And whenever we do have community sessions, not only explaining where it is, but how to get there. I think a lot of times we go to the, oh, it's on the website or it's in the paper. I think we forget some people don't know how to get there, right? Everybody's coming at it from a different level of experience. So I am coming from it from an educator perspective, right? We not only have to tell people where or, or um, how to get the fish, we need to teach them how to, that's the wrong things. We have to teach them how to fish, right? We have to teach them how to get the information so folks have access to that clear and transparent information. Thank you. I agree with everything that Jess just said. 
um, with improvements that certainly could always be made. New ideas are always out there. Um, but with specifically with, gar with regards to transparency, that transparency is so important because A, we are all the taxpayers who fund the school. So we all have a right to know what's going on in the schools for our, our tax dollars. And certainly there's different levels of right to know, I think. Um, you know, certainly if it's an employee concern, that's not our right to know about an employee's personal issue. Um, however, when it comes to the concern of siloing parents, siloing issues that more than one parent has, that can't be tolerated. As a school board member, I can only do as much of the, the information that I have that's transparent from the district, right? And, the only, and once I have that information, then I can be transparent with the voters and the taxpayers. I, I, the, the issue of transparency um, stops with personnel, and that, that I don't know who the, re, who the writer was, of, and I'm not sure where the question's coming from, so that's a little bit, uh, that's a concern for me in trying to answer it. Um, board, the board cannot ever um, be transparent about anything that deals with personnel um, or students in that regard, and that I know has been, unfortunately, um, an issue for the history of Concord that everyone would like to forget. And I, if that's where this is coming from, then, then I think we need to let that go and understand that. Beyond that, um, we need to share the information and bring the community in because without the community, um, we don't have the support we need. The parents don't see the value of the school system, the, the wonderful school system that, that already exists and we'll, we'll no longer support it. They, if folks need answers, we need to give them answers whenever it's appropriate so that they can make the best decisions they can make for their students. Thanks. I was also kind of under the impression that that's what this question was hinting at, more of um, personnel in the school and some issues that came from that and the public feeling that there was a lack of transparency there. Unfortunately, there are things that are not able to be shared with the community when it comes to students, personnel, or if things are being um, pursued criminally or in a legal manner. I think that it's important, though, if something is able to be shared with the public, that it is. And I do think that we do have access to quite a bit of information. It could be better to um, look into how we can get that information out making sure that people know how to access the public meetings, that they, if they can't attend in person, is there a way for them to give their opinion or ask a question and be answered there? Um, just making people more aware of what's available so that they feel as though they're heard and then they can get that information because they may not have heard the information from a meeting because they didn't attend and it doesn't mean that the information isn't out there, just they didn't have access to it in a way that they would think they could. Um, as, again, with transparency, I think that the, the school board has been very transparent recently in trying to bring in the community in any large decisions they're making. I think it's important to be as transparent as possible, and that's something that I really look to bring to the board as well, because I think that when you provide the information firsthand, it is a much better way for the information to be received than if people get pieces and bits from all different areas and hearsay versus you just coming out and saying it. So I, I think there needs to be accountability and transparency when it's available. Thanks. I think when it comes to transparency, as others have mentioned, there are certain legal requirements we can't necessarily mention names of administrators, students, things of that nature. So that really can't be part of the conversation. But when it comes down to transparency, it's more about communication. Uh, one of the things I brought up is that Concord's graduation rate is 70th in the state. We need to improve that. That's not good news. We really shouldn't be advertising it as look at where we are. We should be improving it. But I also think that then comes down to communication. We're hearing bad news. We kind of are upset we, we didn't learn about something that was worse. 
But are we hearing about the good news? Uh, recently, the Monitor had an article on one of the CRTC students, who was actually a Bow High School student, and he is in Mazda's, um, looking to become Mazda's top mechanic in their yearly competition. Uh, I read the article, I saw some of what he does, and it's truly insightful. So I think it comes down to more of a communication of let's not bring forward only the bad news, but let's bring forward the good news, and let's balance it out and show people there is good and bad, unfortunately, that happens, but let's just improve the communication so that everyone's aware of everything that's happening. Okay, I think we're ready for closing statements, running tight on time, so we're gonna do 60 seconds for closing statements, and we'll start with you, Jess. Sure. Thank you so much for having me. This district, our teachers, everybody sitting here tonight, you all matter so much to every single one of us sitting on stage tonight. We're here because we wanna serve you and we wanna serve our communities. I bring to the table years of strong fiscal responsibility. I've worked in the finance industry for a very long time. I've managed books of businesses up to a billion dollars. It is absolutely my priority to make sure that we have a safe, healthy, welcoming district for everybody that is here and also making sure that our taxpayers aren't feeling the burden too much so we can make sure that we continue to be a place where people can afford to live they can thrive, be happy, and be engaged with each other in our community. Thank you so much. I hope to have your vote on election day. Um, it's essential that Concord elect a school board member who's ready to tackle education and social, social challenges head on, call these challenges what they are, and make evidence-based decisions for 21st century education needs. A vote for me is a vote for a current district parent, a new board perspective as a mental health dietitian and with a master's in public health, and experience collaborating with Concord parents, district staff, and the greater Concord community. Uh, I'd like to thank you for coming. In, in considering who to vote for, I think uh, I've become aware that everybody up here is very, very motivated um, and excited to be part of, part of a solution to improving our, our district. Um, student outcomes are our priority. Making sure that all students are making the gains that they need to make, making sure that all students have access to learning, making sure that we are providing students with the best curriculum and the best instruction, and supporting our teachers who each and every day walk into the classroom with the goal of making a difference for each student in that room. And that's the job of the board, and that's the job of everybody who's part of this district, and most importantly, the job of the community. So I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I hope you all um, vote. Thanks. Like everyone said before me, we all are very focused on our students having a great and well-rounded education, and that is our goal. So I'm not gonna touch too much on that. What I'm hoping to bring if I'm voted is a uniqueness in helping to lift some of that burden from our taxpayers. Um, just in the short amount of time since I've put in to run for school board, I've looked into countless different programs, contacted different state agencies, national agencies, looking for solutions to help not take away from the budget and the education that the students need and that we should provide. Um, but with also not burdening the taxpayers. I don't think we have to have one or the other, and it's time to start looking for more creative ways to help offset that burden. Um, I wanna make sure that all students have access to education, the same type of education in whatever way they need it. I think that as far as extracurriculars go, that no one extracurricular should be put above another uh, as far as funding goes. And we need to keep that in mind that the drama kids, the music kids, are just as important as the sports kids, and we need to make sure that they feel just as supported in our decisions on how we spend our budget. And I look forward to your vote. Thank you. So thank you everyone who is attending. Thank you everyone who is watching. 
And thank you, everyone, for who is voting in the upcoming election. Like many of the candidates here, we are all passionate about making sure that our students are the best prepared students we can make. As someone who potentially could be elected, I would like to have your vote so that I can listen to you and hear your concerns and then bring those to the general board so we can discuss it. I think if we don't get that input from everybody, that we're really gonna be hampered by how much of an impact we can make as a school board. So I think communication is the most important part and that we, we need to hear from you because from you, we will hear what we need to do as a board so that we make our schools better for our children. Thank you. Once again, I'd like to thank all the candidates. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your thoughtful answers. This concludes our school board forum. We're gonna take a brief break. I'd like all of the city council candidates who are in contested races in wards one through six to please come up. Thank you all.